There's always that strange transition period in horror movies where things can get lost in the shuffle. The 70s and its nihilism broke late in the decade to swerve into mass killers in the slasher genre. That heyday was far shorter than people remember, but the late 80s did something similar in transitioning to straight-to-video smash successes and a crazy number of sequels and adaptations. That well, too, would dry up, and when Wes Craven released Scream in 1996, the landscape would shift to smart slashers and then found footage. There was a slight teen slasher era first, with things like Urban Legend, Scream sequels, Disturbing Behavior, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and hell, even Final Destination posits literal death as the slasher villain. These are more along the lines of a top shelf example, but one that could qualify for a best horror movie you never saw and a black sheep is Soul Survivors from 2001. One of those shows doesn't exist anymore, so let me tell you why Soul Survivors is the teen horror black sheep that deserves your attention. A good first question that you have is, perhaps, what is this movie anyway? Well, if you look at the DVD or happen to buy that special killer cut, you may expect this movie to be a teen slasher movie like the ones mentioned previously. On the surface level, that's what it is. After you watch it though, it's a strange mixture of Jacob's Ladder and Carnival of Souls. That sounds a lot heavier than most critics were probably willing to give the movie credit for, but that's what I got out of it. Is it as good as either of those? Well, no, it's not the taut, emotional, well-acted, or frightening movie that Ladder is, nor is it the cornerstone of American independent horror films that Carnival is. Its script from writer-director Stephen Carpenter is much more thoughtful than you'd expect. Apart from the movie not being a great flick to begin with, apparently we even gave it a 4 out of 10 when it first came out, it has some other issues as well. The first one is dependent on what cut you watch. The one that was theatrically released was cut for the teen audience, but many of the cuts were exactly what the age demographic looks for, and what they left in, the version you can watch on Tubi, is more spiritual and metaphysical version. Its budget was 17 million, which no doubt included the payments to the star power, as well as the bidding war that Artisan won against Paramount and Fox. Unfortunately, that 17 million would only bring back less than five, making it a monumental failure. Now, part of that was certainly that A, again, this is a cool movie, but it's not an all-time classic, and B, it wasn't really marketed well, but it also had the distinction of being released four days before the terrorist attacks on 9-11. Even if this were a great film, it would have been hard to bounce back from that national tragedy. Getting back to a lighter topic, the script was fought over by studios for a reason. Or at least that's what I'd like to tell you anyway. Stephen Carpenter isn't a huge name, and in fact, this would be the last movie he directed. He also wrote and directed The Dorm That Dripped Blood from 1982, The Power from 1984, and one of my favorite best horrors you never saw, The Kindred from 1987. He was also one of the, like, 20 writers on that last one, too. While the cover of the DVD and poster for the movie are generic as heck, even looking almost exactly the same as a 1998 movie called The Curve and many other teen movies at the time, they did cast right for this film. Four big names from the time appear in leading roles with Wes Bentley, Casey Affleck, Elijah Dushku, and Luke Wilson all adding to the appeal and going on to varying degrees of success. Bentley has lately landed on big TV shows like Yellowstone and American Horror Story, but was also acclaimed two years before this movie with a large role in American Beauty. His other main horror credits is P2 as a stellar villain. Dushku was huge in Buffy and has done a ton of voiceover work, but was also in Wrong Turn a couple years later in the lead, and that movie still holds up. Affleck was able to escape the genre with this being his only entry, and he also says this is his least favorite movie he's ever done. Wilson has also done only one other horror movie, The Vacancy, and I suppose the main thing all these actors have in common is that Soul Survivors soured them on the genre. The biggest surprise is the main character Cassie, played by Melissa Sage Miller. She should have been a bigger star, but mostly stayed on TV with shows like Sleeper Cell, Law & Order, and Raising the Bar. She could have been a good final girl or shown up in more comedies, but it just wasn't to be. The plot of the movie dives into four friends, played by Bentley, Dushku, Sage Miller, and Affleck, that also has some love threads going on between them. It starts with the friends going to a party in an old church where they see a couple of men in odd masks who try to take Cassie away from the dance floor. 
The group takes off, and after some shenanigans involving hidden love and mistaken kisses, they leave with an air of anger and suspicion about them. Cassie is driving and ends up not paying attention, which gets them in a nasty car wreck involving another vehicle. When the dust settles, Cassie along with Annabelle and Matt, played by Bentley and Dushku, are left to pick up the pieces while Affleck Sean was killed instantly. This is the first part of the latter similarities as an inciting incident ends up having branching realities where what we see is mostly a what could be mixed with a calling from reality. Cassie is kind of a loner now with dreams of Sean as well as continuing to see the masked men she saw the night of the party and the accident. She runs into Matt and Annabelle, but they're different in ways that she can't remember or explain. Matt claims Cassie wanted to sleep with him, while Annabelle seems very suspicious and up to something. Even the masked men chase her from time to time or show up at places like her swim meet, but her former friends assure her that it's all in her mind. She eventually seeks shelter and help within the church where we meet Luke Wilson's father Jude. He is the Danny Aiello chiropractor character from Jacob's Ladder that adds a touch of religion to the proceedings. While the character is a guardian angel of sorts in Ladder, and it's entirely possible he doesn't exist in the real world, Wilson's character was a man of God who we find out passed away many years ago. The misinformation and near gaslighting that her friends give her aren't entirely tied to one movie or the other, but the masked men chasing Cassie feel a lot like Herc Harvey himself from Carnival of Souls as they are menacing and mysterious. This is taken to the next level though, as the danger is real and physical instead of just ominous and constrained to the background. The paranoia and danger go hand in hand to the point where Cassie even fights back and seemingly kills one of them with a fluorescent light, but of course, when she brings someone back to show them the body and the gore, they're both gone. She asks Matt to take her home to her family, but instead he takes her back to where everything began. Events, minus Sean this time, begin to materialize again from the night of the crash, but when Matt wants to kiss her, she says goodbye to him with a bottle to the noggin. She then leaves and sees Annabelle die in an eerily similar crash. She gets out of the car like a dummy and gets hit by another car before the spirit of Father Luke approaches her and eventually wakes up in a hospital bed. We do get scenes of her taken by Gurney in a even less than PG-13 version of Tim Robbins' ordeal in Jacob's Ladder. It turns out that Matt and Annabelle died in the original crash while Sean survived and Cassie was put into a coma. The other car they crashed into contained the would-be stalkers and masks and the alt-girl Raven who was seducing Annabelle and tried to do the same to Cassie. This is where the movie branches off from both of its cinematic inspirations. Apologies on spoilers for movies that are 34 and 62 years old respectively, but Carnival of Souls ends with its main character revealed to be killed in an auto accident that is the inciting incident for the movie. Jacob's Ladder similarly has all of the events seen after his Vietnam injury as a coma-like fever dream of what could have been mixed with some seriously terrifying things. While both of those movies have our characters dead, Cassie ends up making it out. There's a lot to like here, and I have to give a lot of credit to Carpenter. He was able to mix two obvious influences on him into a teen horror movie with all the same messages about guilt, forgiveness, letting go, and moving on that both earlier films put out there. Both of those much more loved films are well known, but Soul Survivors shouldn't be pushed aside with the other known Drek from its era. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. With two different versions, alternate endings, and a unique premise and cast, I know there was a solid if not great movie to be found in here at some point. It's not going to win you over in the first viewing or overtake some of your all-time classics from contemporaries or originals. But Soul Survivors is a black sheep that yearns for more, and just happens to, as Robert Browning would say, have its reach exceed its grasp. Give it a shot and then watch what inspired it to see what it really wanted to accomplish. Yeah. 